Economic Development Committee uh, will come to order. It is Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. We have a quorum, and a quorum is present. Um, members, and, and for the audience's purposes too, we will have a number of other members that will come in. There are also some that will view what's going on online as well. But today is, is what I would consider like any other day, but especially today is an important informational hearing on the possibility of both federal mass dollars to help build our semiconductor production industry in Minnesota, but as well as if there are any other investments that we can make in order to expand in this important area. Uh, we don't usually get a lot of federal dollars back relative to other states, so this is an opportunity to address that and leverage federal uh, money to grow our economy. I also believe that the issue that we're going to discuss today is a national security issue. Uh, this isn't something we'd like to do. This is something we'd like to do if we can. The, the pandemic showed, showed we cannot be relying on Taiwan and China to produce the, uh, these products. They are essential to our, our country and economy continuing to function, as well as all of our everyday lives. And we need to bring that manufacturing back here uh, or grow what's here uh, so that we can avoid supply chain disruptions and we can create good, high paying jobs in the US and in Minnesota in particular. So you're gonna have an opportunity to hear from a, a cross section of businesses today that are in this industry and they're gonna talk about what they're doing and we're gonna also talk a little about what we can do in order to enhance their business model, but also benefit the great state of Minnesota. Just so you know, members, that we do not have bill language drafted yet, um, but, but we wanted to give this committee members a chance to familiarize themselves with this issue since it's is something significant uh, that will come before us later this session. So look at this with an eye towards a bill coming before us and for us to do something significant. Uh, so I am going to call Dr. Iyer. If you'll please come to the testifier's table and state your name for the record uh, and, and give us your presentation. And members, you will be allowed to, uh, to ask Dr. Iyer any questions that you have. Uh, and we look forward to not just Dr. Iyer, but the other uh, presenters that will come and testifiers that, that will come later. With that, Dr. Iyer, we are uh, here uh, and standing at attention whenever you are ready to proceed. Oh, and one last thing. If I can also encourage everyone who comes up to testify to sort of speak closely to your mic because we want to be able to hear you because the, the, the more you lean back, the harder it is sometimes for the committee as well as those who are online to hear you. So with that, Dr. Iyer. Good afternoon, Chairman, Senator Champion, and members of the committee. My name is Surya Iyer. I'm the president of Polar Semiconductor. Polar is located just east of the Mall of America in Bloomington, and we are the largest producer of semiconductor wafers in the state of Minnesota. I also teach as an adjunct at the University of St. Thomas. I'm an engineering professor there. And really, it is my distinct honor to be invited to talk to you on this topic of the CHIPS Act. I'm going to start this conversation with a quick introduction to the company that I work for, Polar Semiconductor, and how we fit into the semiconductor world. Um, we are a manufacturer of high voltage and power semiconductors. This is a subset of the semiconductor world. These are semiconductors that go into automotive, defense, um, aerospace, and other commercial applications like air conditioners, TVs, washer dryers, and things of that, of that nature. You can think of these semiconductors as quite different from the ones that are in 
the uh, mobile phone. We operate in tens of volts to over a thousand volts. So this is a very different world uh, that we operate in. This is a very specialty type of uh, semiconductors that we make. Um, Polar has been in the uh, Bloomington footprint. We've had a footprint in Bloomington for over 60 years. We came out of uh, controlled data and we are, as I mentioned, we're in the automotive space, so we are, uh, quality is part of our DNA, reliability of the devices, longevity or durability of the devices is very important, and we, we focus on that. Our, we have about 550 employees in the campus, uh, working in a variety of different roles, uh, from uh, people who don't have formal degrees to people who have PhD degrees. And uh, we work 24-7, 365, 12-hour shifts, four shifts. And uh, all of our employees have deep roots in Minnesota and in the Midwest. Just a, I didn't want to add a, a slide on this, because just in the interest of time, but Semiconductors are kind of a unique technology. If you, if you want to think of them, the easiest way, this is this my professor hat, the easiest way to think of them are they are on-off switches, and they are, just imagine them in the nanometer scale. And then you apply an external voltage to make that current or electrons to flow, and that's how the switch gets turned on or off. And a great example of that is one of the products we make for our, one of our customers, which is a sensor chip that detects a magnet that's attached to the wheel of your car. And because of that magnet, there's a small current that's generated in this chip, and it tells you what's the speed, what's the angle, and you can use that for whatever calculations that the computer chip in the car needs to do to make sure that the people inside the car are safe or they're getting the performance that they paid for. So that's an example of a semiconductor chip in the real world. I wanna move and talk about where the United States is in the semiconductor world. It's actually not a very bleak scenario. This is a bar chart of the different aspects of the semiconductor value chain. You can see that in certain areas like design and intellectual property, the United States is doing reasonably well. But I want to highlight the areas that we have really concerning weaknesses, and that is specifically in the foundry, which is contract manufacturing, the manufacturing of these semiconductors. You can see about 90% of that is being done in China and Taiwan. And one thing I've learned in my several decades in this industry is that you outsource the manufacturing, it is not that much later that the technology is also gonna go away. And that is the risk that we have to mitigate and work against. Polar produces unique technology, so we are actually situated in a very unique circumstance for automotive, especially for this XCV transition. Aerospace defense, as I mentioned before, we have specific expertise that's almost unique in the country, in the United States. We do things that nobody else does. And the demand is there. We have the capability of bringing back these technologies. Our customers are willing to bring back those technologies from Taiwan back to, back to, back to Polar. And we can develop new technologies with some of our customers, for example, these discrete technologies that are also a big gap in the United States capabilities. And the point I'm making here is that we can do this in the next 18 to 24 months. A lot of the announcements that have been made out there in the country are basically putting a shovel to the ground and looking, waiting for results for the next four or five years. We can make an impact to the supply chain relatively much faster. Now I want to talk a little bit about what the Chips and Science Act is and how this is going to enable companies like Polar and others who are going to testify and other companies in the semiconductor business in the, in, the, in the Minnesota area. By the way, the Chips Act, I believe, is a transformational uh, act. 
the uh, the impact on national security is going to be direct. The impact on the uh, reliability of the supply chain, uh, on things that we all touch on a daily basis, is going to be tremendous. And this is a $52 billion act over five years, a majority of which, $39 billion of it, is going towards manufacturing incentives. And the purpose is to reshore critical semiconductor manufacturing back to the United States. At the bottom line, it's leveling the playing field. The Asian governments give huge subsidies to these companies. The incentives are massive, and it just is debilitating for a com company in the United States to compete. So it's leveling the playing field. The 10 billion piece of it is current technologies and uh, the wider value chain, which is where Polar will operate, and I suspect most of the companies in Minnesota will operate as well. There's opportunities in R&D, the $11 billion for centers of innovation. The University of Minnesota, the flagship university of the state, is situated really well to take advantage of that. There's uh, the Department of Defense, $2 billion for kind of small startup lab to you know, mass production type of transitions, advanced R&D, and there's a 25% tax credit for equipment that's purchased in 2023 to, through 2026. One of the most important objectives of this act is the workforce development. Sen um, Secretary Gina Riamondo, Secretary of Commerce, especially passionate about this, so am I. This is gonna create good paying jobs and as Senator Pratt mentioned to me before, it is not just jobs, it's, it's careers. It's careers that's gonna sustain families for the long term. And <clears throat> it's very important that we increase the participation of people who are economically disadvantaged, underrepresented populations, black, indigenous, people of color, people from rural communities, and veterans of the United States Armed Forces. The purpose of this act is not just to feed a bunch of money to companies. The goal is to make sure that the communities that we are in, we're operating in, also benefit. There's a wide benefit, and that's, that benefit is spread across the community. And to do that, they want us to work in partnership with companies up and down the supply chain and engage with universities and colleges and then leverage local regional businesses, organizations, uh, workforce organizations and other organizations uh, to make sure that this, the benefits of these projects are spread widely across the communities. We, we serve the communities that we're part of. I want to talk a little bit now about how companies like Polar, and again, I, I believe that many of the other companies in Minnesota would similarly approach and take advantage of the Chips and Science Act. One of the big differences between companies in Taiwan, China versus the US is the scale at which they operate. Fabs, or the factories as we call them, fabs, are about more than twice the size of an average fab in the United States. And scale is a direct impl implicator on the cost of our operations. So we're, we're expected to think big. And Polar is going to double its current capacity in the next 18 to 24 months. In order to make sure that the risks are mitigated, the government of the United States wants us to work with private entities, bring private capital into the equation. Polar is working with a US-based private equity company, and we're gonna invest hundreds of millions of dollars into this project. In order to build these regional clusters, in order to build these ecosystems that are gonna sustain us not just for the period of the funding for the next five years, but for decades, we need to build these partnerships, and we're doing that by reshoring some of the technology through our customers back from Taiwan to Bloomington, we're gonna develop an advanced technology with one of our other customers, a uh, small company, and I cannot tell you how grateful they are that they have an option 
at Polar in the United States in Minnesota so they don't have to worry about their IP protection. We're going to create um, potentially a partnership with the University of Minnesota and uh, leadership of uh, Seagate Technology to create a manufacturing, smart manufacturing project uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's a possibility. Now, one of the reasons I'm here in front of you is that the federal government requires that we have state and local incentives. It is a requirement. We cannot apply for CHIPS Act funding without having secured state and local incentives. And so we're partnering with the city of Bloomington and the, uh, and the executive part of the Minnesota state government with the Department of uh, Employment uh, and Economic Development. As I said before, workforce development is very important. It is very important personally to me. And we are working to create this pipeline, potentially with the University of Minnesota as a hub, and then using other Minsku and other private uh, universities and colleges as partners. And we're going to create about 100 jobs or more. And the multiplication factor of this industry is quite significant, uh, four, four and a half to five times. So you can imagine just Polar's investment is going to create hundreds of jobs. If you add the investments of other ecosystem companies, this could be thousands of jobs. And to, in order to make sure that the, sh the gains are shared broadly, we will not just try, we will employ minority, veteran, women-owned businesses. We will employ uh, union, labor union contractors. And in order to make sure, and this is the overarching requirement of this act, is to make sure that tax dollars of the United States taxpayer and citizens of Minnesota are protected. In order to do that, we are going to provide solid business plans with customer commitments that go not just short term but long term. Financial projections, growth potentials, and create projects that are specifically addressing the gaps in the United States ecosystem. Things that we're weak in, that's the kind of projects that we're going to propose. Another huge opportunity is, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the $2 billion Department of Defense opportunity. We're also potentially partnering with the University of Minnesota for not just the next generation, but the generation after technologies. <clears throat> what does that mean for Minnesota? What does that mean for you all as representatives of the citizens of Minnesota? What, what, why is this good for them? Why is this the right place to do this? I think that the impressive tech legacy of the state of Minnesota, we have had companies like Control Data, Univac, Cray Research. Decades ago, we were leaders in high tech and manufacturing. We still have that DNA. And I think we need to get that back. And this is an opportunity to get that back. And we have all the ingredients to make that happen. We have a, a, a critical mass of companies, uh, semiconductor chip makers, semiconductor equipment makers, others down the supply chain companies. And some of those are listed here, and I apologize if I'm missing somebody, but uh, that's, that's not a, a small list. This is a significant list of companies with large revenues. There's... <clears throat> natural advantages that Minnesota gives to us. We're blessed with adequate water. Semiconductor fabs consume a lot of water compared to some of the states down south. I think that's a huge advantage. We have affordable, reliable utilities and systems. And we're not in an earthquake zone. I can't tell you how many of these fabs are sitting in earthquake zones that can disrupt the supply chain if just one earthquake happens. And at the end of the day, it's the people. We have the people. We have a strong STEM pipeline. It needs to be redirected, but we have it. University of Minnesota, Minsky colleges, universities, private colleges and universities to feed potentially thousands of jobs that we're going to create with these projects. And I don't want to minimize this. We have to play to our strength. And our strength is the medical device industry, just like the automotive in, uh, EV transition is going to get a lot more um, 
chips into cars, the next generation of medical devices is going to have a hugely larger number of silicon chip content. And they would rather work with a company that's a couple of miles down the road than a couple of oceans on the other side of the world. So the opportunity is huge and immense, and it is timely, and I think we need to take advantage of it. And that is what a lot of other states are doing. They're taking advantage of this opportunity. There's $15 billion or more of support funding from states like New York, Texas, Ohio, Arizona, and so on. There's also already plans to create these national semiconductor technology centers. Workforce development groups are being formed. We need to, we need to get uh, be urgent about some of these things. Now, as I mentioned again, I'm going to repeat, the semiconductor ecosystem requires the state to invest for successful CHIPS grant applications. Timing is important. <coughs> Excuse me. The National Institute of Te uh, Standards and Technology in Bethesda, uh, sorry, Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, is where the program office of the CHIPS Act is located. They are expected to announce the request for proposals in March 2023. There's not too much time. And one thing I want to highlight for all of you and to the listeners is that these projects are big dollar projects. The announcements that have happened in the, across the United States, the expansion and new projects are in the range of $100 million to $20 billion. And um, that's because the capital equipment is substantially expensive and we have, there's, it's a very capital intensive industry, the manufacturing piece of it. And so the state support has to be robust and commensurate with the investments that companies and our partners in finance are going to make. So with that, I will stop and uh, thank you. Um, uh, Chairman, Senator Champion, and members of the committee for listening to me uh, on this very important topic, and I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. All right, before I get to some of the other committee members who will have questions, I notice uh, as a part of your uh, presentation that you talk about the University of Minnesota, you talk about MinSQ, uh, making that connection in order to make sure that there's, there's a pipeline and feeder system. Uh, can you tell me what your plan is to engage in individuals not directly connected with the University of Minnesota or Minskew or may live in rural M Minnesota? How, how do we align the community with educational institutions based on your plan? Uh, Chairman, that's a very good question. And one of the um, guidelines in the CHIPS Act addresses directly that question. We don't necessarily have to depend on the universities and the Minsky other partners to get <clears throat> get these uh, students and bright young people to come and participate in this. We can work with workforce development uh, organizations. We can work with uh, even high schools and other uh, employment organizations across the state to uh, bring these uh, students. We can train them. Think about, think about a student from, uh, you know, a, economically disadvantaged community or you know, a, a person of color who, is, who does not have access uh, to some of these schools, they can be leveraged to come and work at Polar. We can train them. We can have high school students come and work for us as an apprentice. Experiential training, six months, a year. And we can train them, we can make them into uh, skilled maintenance technicians who can have jobs that are uh, several times more the, you know, through their careers. Uh, even their starting salaries are much, going to be much higher than the average salary of a, of a Minnesota resident. Uh, Senator Putnam, and before I go to Senator Hur, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, uh, Mr. Iyer, my question is actually going to follow up in a sense on what Senator Champion was talking about. Uh, I've lived in Minnesota for 30 years, uh, but I grew up in Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley largely because of the proximity between higher ed, a willing workforce, the low cost of living. These are characteristics that I think most of it would suggest are endemic in the regional centers in Minnesota. So, I don't know, places like St. Cloud, hypothetically, uh, or Rochester, Mankato, 
Duluth. Uh, there seems to be a great deal of potential to build this industry in those spaces specifically, again, because of low cost of living, willing workforce, infrastructure, and proximity to higher ed. Uh, is that a consideration when we're thinking about the growth of this industry, about the regional diversity specifically of Minnesota? Uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Iyer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Putnam. That is exactly one of the things that we want to accomplish, is that we want to make sure that it is not just um, within a 20 to 50 mile radius of where these companies are. We want to be able to bring participation from uh, future employees who can be brought in from places like St. Cloud, Rochester, Iron Range. Uh, that, is, that is the opportunity here. And, and in order to make that opportunity happen, we will have to work with a variety of stakeholders to bring these parties together. And, I, and I, my worry is that time is the enemy. We have to get these things done fast. And I would appreciate any support we can get from legislators such as yourselves, uh, the, the office of the governor, and uh, any other, uh, we are already engaged in a, uh, in a coalition of companies, so we're trying to do this. Uh, we've, we've received a lot of support from companies up and down the supply chain who want to help us with some of these things. They have, some of these companies are large companies and they have systems and processes that they already have and we can leverage, and that's what I expect to do. Uh, Senator Putnam, follow up. Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Ayer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hurt. Dr. Ayer, uh, welcome and thank you for your explanation. You know, uh, it's very exciting. Um, and I know that uh, uh, the semiconductor is, you know, as you mentioned, is, is Asian based and you're competing with the incentive that the, of Asian government wanting to keep their company there. What, what I wonder, and I'm sure you can dig, I can do my own research, but you know, maybe you could give us insight. How did you? How do American win relocating those companies here instead of you know? Because we're we're you know, as you say, the Asian government are putting so much incentive into keeping the company overseas. Dr. Ayer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. I uh, I think the geopolitical situation that we're in is has created an immense opportunity for the United States. <clears throat> the, um, there's companies, there's actually Taiwanese companies who are very interested in establishing manufacturing here in the United States. I think there's an opportunity for Taiwanese companies to also help with the overall supply chain resilience by having a lot of their semiconductors manufactured here. That is a huge opportunity. And um, it, it, at the end of the day, I think the American people invented the semiconductor industry. We made the semiconductor industry what it is, Silicon Valley, for example. And we have the talent, we have the uh, we have the overall infrastructure. We need to make sure that we are cost competitive. I think scale, I think some of these kind of incentives, and they don't have to be at the same level as the Asian governments. The, we, we, need, we need a little bit of support to make ourselves more competitive with the Asian companies. And we'll be, and I think because the location of the United States, the safety of the United States, the fact that we treat intellectual property uh, as a valuable commodity and we take care of it, those are all advantages for American companies. Uh, follow up, Senator Hurt. And thank you for the answer. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, with, with relocating companies to here to Polar with, in, in conjunction with Semiconductor, you'll, you'll have employees or specialists from overseas as well and um, you know I as we as government are representative of our own district and the state of Minnesota we also want to empower our ingrown our homegrown intellect uh, 
whether a semiconductor or you know a scientist or um, you know assembly line um, manufacturer like you mentioned the high school level can be trained you know so um, I like it to be robust and I like to you know um, be as inclusive as possible this is more not in term of question but just a, a comment a remarks to it you know in terms of even women people of color rural work workers and veterans you know and lots of time under the umbrella of people of color um, we forgot the ingrown of people of color we tend to look at people of color international and and then that missed out mm -hmm. a lot of my constituents um, you know are Asian Americans, and we missed out on that opportunity within that pool of it, of scientists, uh, technology scientists. So I just want to bring that uh, to your attention as you move forward. And we're we're look. I mean, I'm not speaking for them, but I'll, I'm excited and I look forward to a partnership. I would encourage perhaps each of each of us do advocate for our own city and our own region and. I represent Eastside St. Paul, so St. Paul, I, I hope that the, the city of St. Paul will, you know, uh, be talking to you as well, or you be talking to the city of St. Paul. Mm -hmm. Because when you build factory, you know, futures that, that engage the future, and if you build in um, North Minneapolis, you know, uh, where San Champion is, or you build where, you know, Eastside St. Paul will be facing uh, inequity, it will change that dynamic. It will change the, the outlook of our young people. Yeah. So I just want to put it out there for, for you to think and also share with the um, community here as well. So thank you for your presentation. You know, I'm very excited about this. I pay attention to international relationship of Taiwan and China as well. So you know, this is an exciting time. Thank you, Senator Hur. Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Doctor, for the presentation. Um, the support you need from DEED, what, can you just elaborate on what, what is needed for your company, what is needed for the industry in the state, in your opinion? You. Dr. Iyer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Gra Dram. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. I apologize if I'm not. Um, the... Um, the governor's office announced recently that uh, they have allocated $150 million towards support of CHIPS Act and other, um, in terms of uh, supporting matching funds. Uh, I think from, on behalf of Polar and the semiconductor ecosystem community in general, I'm grateful. Uh, but I think, uh, <clears throat> I also want to say that it is a good starting point um, we are looking at, in general, I mean, again, I don't want, uh, some of these things I'm uh, uh, unfortunately not able to reveal the total numbers at this point because they're not being publicly announced. Um, but we are looking at several companies making several hundred millions of dollars of investments. And, uh, of course, the number one funding source is going to be private, then it's going to be the federal government and the state is going to be the, uh, the lowest in terms of support, but it needs to be in some sort of a ratio. By the way, uh, Senator Draham, the uh, federal government has not released yet the matching requirements, so we will hear about it in the near term, and so we may be able to answer your question better at that point of time. Senator Draham, a follow-up, or can I go to Senator Muhammad? Thank you. Uh, please keep us posted on, on that, if you would, on, on the uh, matching part. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Muhammad. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I actually have a follow-up to Senator Draham's question. Um, would these be ongoing or one-time money? Uh, Dr. Iyer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Muhammad. Um, this, uh, the CHIPS Act itself is a five-year act, and potentially could be extended. Um, not all of the uh, appropriations have been approved, so this potentially could go on for a longer time. Uh, so 
and and uh, the factories and the expansions and the technologies that change quite rapidly in the semiconductor industry. Um, we're looking at some set of projects that will happen in the next two years, some set of projects that will happen in the next five years. Uh, so it, it would be ideal if this funding is over several years rather than one-time funding. Follow up, Senator Mohammed. Oh, Mr. Okay. Chair, I do. Um, so if our... Uh, what are the consequences if our application for these uh, dollar match does not come to fruition? What, what's the, what are the consequences for the state? Dr. Iyer. Thank you, Chair. Good question, Senator Muhammad. The, uh, as I mentioned, the state of Minnesota has a legacy of this high tech, and unfortunately, the legacy has diminished over the last couple of decades. If we don't make this investment, and let me tell you one thing, when I look at this chart of other states investing in the semiconductor industry, we are not that far away from many of these states in terms of the ecosystem that we already have. Um, we have we have more than uh, I don't want to I don't want to downplay a specific state or but I, in general, I I believe that our ecosystem is actually as good as or even larger than some of the states that are colored in blue in this map. And so if we don't take advantage of it, other states will take advantage of it. And if other states don't take advantage of it, then the status quo will get worse, which is that the comp competitiveness that Minnesota has and the United States has will diminish. We should not let that happen. I think this is not just about semiconductor companies, it is about high tech, it is about manufacturing as well. And I think the kind of people that we will train don't necessarily have to stay in the companies that, that train them. They will move around. They'll go to the med tech companies. They'll go to other manufacturing companies. And this is a skill level, uh, quality of life level improvement, opportunity for making that change uh, that we should not let go. Thank you. Follow up, are you okay? All right. Uh, any other questions before we go to our next testifier? Thank you, Dr. Iyer, and thank you so much for the, your work on this important issue. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you very much, members of the committee. With that being said, I'm going to ask for Mr. Jerome Hamilton, if you'll please come to the testifier's table. And it's my understanding uh, you also have Mr. Cunningham with you, as, as well as Mr. Uh, Dukanik. Dukanik, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there. So, uh, so I'll come to the table, and please state your names for the record, uh, and, and then you can begin your presentation. Thank you. I'm Jerome Hamilton. I'm Dr. Jevney Cunningham. Uh, Laurent de Koning. All right. So, Dr. Hamilton, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, notice I put doctor in front of your name now? <laughs> That's okay. okay. Uh, so, Mr. Hamilton, whenever you're ready, please go forward. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking Senator Bobby Joe Champion, as well as the entire Jobs and Economic Development Committee, for this opportunity to share with you today. And we're pretty excited about what we're doing. We, we feel that what we're doing is positively impactful for jobs and economic development in the state of Minnesota. We're FlexForge, and we design and manufacture components for electric vehicle charging uh, stations, as well as the uh, car side inlets. Um, we office right now in our manufacturing facility is in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Uh, I have um, stated with me our manufacturing leader as well as our CEO with us today. And what I want to do is start off by letting our CEO give you an overview in greater detail of what we do, and then I'll close out. Thank you so much. And who would that be? Jevney Cunningham. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, if you'd be so kind to state your name for the record and speak closely to the microphone, we want to make sure that we get a chance to hear your robust presentation. So yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jevney Cunningham. Thank you, Laurent. So FlexForge is a company that I started a number of years ago um, with the talent of finding commonalities in technical spaces, in different systems, and I eventually started looking at the electric vehicle charging infrastructure and at every circumstance where you need to charge an electric vehicle, you need two critical things. You need the actual charging station, and you need the interface to the vehicle. 
we've targeted those products in order to allow us to get into the EV charging space and the vehicle space and bring domestic work back home. Next slide, please. As I said, the four products that we saw before are all the critical mating parts in any charging network, any charging system. Anytime you do this, they're required. Next slide. Current challenge, most of these parts, even though they're being distributed in America and these service contracts are being put out by American companies, are actually sourced overseas in China. What we see is the benefit in bringing all of this domestic manufacturing home from a engineering standpoint and from a build it with American quality mentality. Next. This is your slide. No. So what we envision is actually bringing a clean energy hub into Minnesota. We're basically looking at bringing all the infrastructure required by the American auto industry and also government mandates for changing all these things over by 2025, making them here and distributing everything from Minnesota as a core source of the technology. So uh, I'm Laurent de Koning. I'm a CEO of Machining Technology and we're partnering with FlexForge. And if I could just remind you to speak directly in that mic as close as possible. Thank you there. Yep. We are located in uh, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Currently, we have uh, 71 employees. Uh, half of them are uh, uh, minority or, uh, employees, uh, different backgrounds. Our core business, we are a mold maker, machine shop. And uh, we find this a great opportunity to help FlexForge uh, developing uh, this product. We already built and uh, did uh, the prototype and uh, the first production batch. And uh, going forward, we think we can create about 160 uh, plus new jobs uh, once FlexForge is fully scaled up in the next five years um, by uh, going into uh, different markets. Those jobs, uh, mainly manufacturing, uh, basically developing uh, trade uh, skilled employees, uh, machinists, mold makers, uh, plastic injection and uh, assembly people, also developing the engineering team and uh, warehouse and shipping. So a lot of diversification, and uh, that's really my passion. I uh, grew up in Belgium and Germany, moved here in uh, Minnesota 20 years ago, and I uh, really love uh, the manufacturing aspect, and I want to keep growing that in Minnesota. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about us and the manufacturing side. We are already a very, um, we're, we're heavily involved in the automotive ecosystem today. We're, minor, we're a certified minority supplier. As you can see there on the bottom left, um, the OEM members of the National Minority Certified Development Council. Um, I actually started my career in automotive right out of Georgia Tech, spent uh, 16 years in the automotive industry. In fact, my latest automotive assignment was plant manager of the Ford assembly plant here along Mississippi River Boulevard. That was my plant for several years prior to uh, joining 3M as a vice president. I know this space extremely well. Uh, spent uh, a couple years of working at NUMI in uh, Fremont, California as well, which was a GM Toyota joint venture where I had the opportunity to really learn the uh, Toyota production system. Um, I should say a couple years, just under a couple years where I had the opportunity to learn the Toyota production system and my charge was to go back to General Motors and teach it to senior executives inside General Motors lean manufacturing. So when it comes to quality and operational excellence, um, I have a strong, strong background there as well as uh, uh, later moving over to 3M to work in business development. But the intent of this slide is to sh show that we're very well involved in this ecosystem already and we have a very good understanding of it because we have a tremendous amount of experience in this space. Today, you see those uh, OEMs listed there. We actually have inroads into all of them. We're in communications with all of them. But it, today, we already have an, a, an agreement with Daimler Trucks in North America um, where we're doing a joint technology development with them and we will co-own the intellectual property. Um, and a lot of positive discussion around them uh, sending us business. We're actually excited about how the discussions are progressing. 
Um, so we're pretty excited about that partnership. We also have, outside of the OEM space, um, we're making a positive impact on the tech BIPOC technology founder space as well. Uh, through some of the work I do with Brown Venture Group, there's an, a company called Plugs In. Um, they manufacture the complete EV charging stations. We are going to be a component supplier to them, and we have a 400,000 unit LOI right now from them that we're pretty excited about, and we have a very strong uh, relationship with them. So not only are we uh, going to be getting volume from the automotive OEMs, uh, we also have the uh, charging the companies that manufacture the actual charging stations will be supplying components to them. And there's a this is a very um, the space is growing uh, very significantly. Um, and we're actually supporting that ecosystem as well, uh, the BIPOC technology startup system around electric vehicle charging. I think team is important, so I always like to spend a little time on the team. Um, Javni is uh, a graduate of University of Michigan. He has a PhD in manufacturing engineering from University of Michigan and a significant amount of experience in the uh, semiconductor space. Uh, Lawrence spent several years at Caterpillar uh, and operational excellence. Uh, and as he stated prior as the CEO of Machining Technology, our partner, of which I'm an advisory board member in that company as well. Uh, Patrick DeConnick, um, there is a relationship there. That's uh, Lawrence's dad. He and I actually worked together at 3M. He was actually my boss. We spent several years together creating a lot of success together at 3M. Uh, and so I'm just delighted to be partnered with them because I know what I'm getting. Um, myself, I'm an alumnus of Morehouse College. Uh, Georgia Tech and the Harvard Business School of Advanced Management Program. Spent a, a number of years in automotive, as I stated prior, um, and also a lot of business development experience uh, through 3M and also was CEO of a biotech company called Open Therapeutics prior to all of this. So I feel that we have a very talented core team, uh, and then we also have a number of other talented engineering resources on our team as well. Mr. Hamilton, thank you so much. Uh, just, I'm sure that you probably mentioned this, but I just want to make sure that uh, we highlight it again. Where is FlexForce now? Is it an entity now? Um, where is it? How many employees do you have? And any investment from the state, what will that do? I saw that there was a yep. slide, but I just want to make sure that we evolve to that place in a real way. Yeah, we are a post-revenue entity now with our manufacturing being done in Brooklyn Park. Um, we have in that facility, not all of those workers are working on FlexFord product, but that facility has roughly around 72, I think, employees. And uh, in FlexForge right now, we have roughly around 10. Okay. And uh, any other questions? Uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I, I had a, another meeting, so I'm, I missed something that I think is very important. I do apologize if you already... Um, mention this. So um, are, you're asking for $10 million for FlexForce? Correct. Uh, and uh, I, I think... Uh, and just so that we know that you have to speak through the chair, so so once I Sorry. Once you yep. ask the question and then I yes. uh, will then call on you to answer. That's just to keep things straight and clear. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so a $10 million uh, investment, I'm, I'm reading here about the 160 employees over five years, and I couldn't quite hear all of your comments about where is FlexForce now? Do you have already the, the building, um, and this is to invest in the employees, in uh, attracting those employees? So can you just kind of flesh out the details about how, how this $10 million uh, would be used? Uh, 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 Mr. Hamilton. Yes. Thank you for the question. Uh, the $10 million is primary to hire new employees to actually meet the volume requirements. So, for example, that 400,000 unit LOI that I covered earlier, that's a $50 million purchase order and a significant amount of um, labor that's required to do that work, as well as uh, fund usage of funds there as well. We'll be continuing to round out and build the engineering team as well to actually support the volume. Because when you go to work with these OEMs, they're very, very, very demanding in terms of their requirements of money you have to spend to support their supply chain requirements, inventory you have to hold, resources you have to hire to follow up with them, quality standards, and also making sure the workforce is properly trained to meet the quality requirements. So the answer to your question is building out the workforce 
building out the team and also making sure we have the right manufacturing processes. So there'll be some spending inside the manufacturing plan as well to support the requirements. Senator Nelson, follow up. Uh, just a little bit of Excuse me. Well, so a four hundred thousand uh, dollar letter of intent. Yes. And um, w what is the letter of intent for? And um, is there a time limit on that? I, I think that's those are like important things to know. What does that include? What's the time limit on that? Uh, what type of uh, escape clauses are there, or things needed to uh, cement uh, a letter of intent? This letter of intent. Uh, Mr. Hamilton. Yes. Letter is, letters, letter of intents are not uh, contractually binding. They just right. serve as goodwill to keep the discussions going. And it serves, the intent is, is that it takes a lot of time to have these meetings and for us to divert, devote our resources to this organization. We requested a letter of intent to show that they're committed to working with us and being a partner with us. And that letter of intent, that it, it, it's, a, it's sort of a verbal commitment for 400,000 units. I know this organization very well um, over the span of what's the lifetime of is that a two year two years 400,000 units over two years is what I believe uh, Senator uh, uh, Nelson a follow-up or I'm gonna go to Senator um, Pratt I would have more follow-up later but thank you for that clarification thank Sen you Senator Pratt thank you thank you mr. chair and, and just to follow up on Senator Nelson's question and and the answer so Am I understand the $10 million you're requesting is really just for working capital? Uh, Mr. Hamilton. Yeah. Working capital is, I look at that, I view that as inventory. So I'm uh, talking about Mr. Hamilton, can you move closer to the mic? Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, working capital, I view that. I look at that as inventory. I think it's a combination of working capital, hiring additional resources. Resources cost money. Making sure we train those resources appropriately and then making sure we can meet all the requirements of the OEMs in terms of being able to do business with them. Um, if it's okay, uh, first of all, thank you for the question, Senator Pratt. If it's okay, I'll also like to let Lauren interject on more detail in the manufacturing facility, if that's okay. Mr. To the testifier. Yep, so the 10 million will also be used to buy new equipment, automation, and uh, making investment in CapEx to build the tooling to uh, be able to scale up to those volumes. Uh, Senator Pratt, follow-up? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for that answer because the initial answer sounded like, okay, let's not call it working capital. It was operating expenses, right? We were paying salaries, basically covering, uh, you know, the, the short-term obligations. I guess I look at, at working capital as more about uh, having the cash on hand to pay short-term obligations, whether they be salaries, whether they be uh, invoices, whatever it is, right? And uh, so, I'm, you know, it'd be interesting to know how much is, tr is truly going to CapEx. Um, and Mr. Chair, I would also, you know, I would, I, I think we should have a follow-up around the programs that need offers for these types of programs. And I know that you and I have talked on many occasions about um, short-term loan programs that might be uh, guaranteed by the state uh, for some of these expenses and, and looking at maybe a more, uh, what's, what's the word I'm thinking, structured uh, solution rather than a, a one-off solution. Um, because typically when we do incentives, they around, uh, you know, increasing or, or keeping jobs within the state, as you'll recall, uh, we did one uh, in Duluth uh, to keep 180 jobs uh, based on tax incentives and, and other types of incentives rather than a direct cash infusion. And uh, so I'd like to continue this conversation, um, but I think it's it's interesting, and I, and I you know I appreciate um, where the uh, uh, you know where FlexForge is going. I you know I'm always we've got um, you know Launch Minnesota for. Uh, very innovative uh, uh, companies and and you know like like you're talking about um, we have angel ta you know angel investment tax credits that have uh, expired and certainly you know I've had talks with the governor in the past about making a permanent and something we should we should be taking a look at to make sure that we do have private capital infusions coming into the state helping companies just like FlexForge um, I think I've rambled on long enough. Thank you, Senator Pratt. And one of the things I want to make, the, make sure that the committee understands, this is 
our initial discussions with these uh, innovative companies uh, and for us to uh, have bills drafted and figure out what that looks like. And, and then they would certainly have to come back and speak specifically to what's in the bill, right? And, and, and uh, what that would look like. So uh, uh, Senator Nelson and then since, uh, Senator Housley. Senator Nelson? Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I will hold my questions were a little bit more detailed and we'll wait until there's another uh, opportunity to ask those. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, that was interesting presentation. And um, uh, uh, anyway, um, is there another domestic company that uh, makes the vehicle chargers and the inlets and the handles here in the U.S.? That is uh, 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 Senator. Excuse me, Mr. Hamilton. I almost called you Senator Hamilton. Did you hear that? <laughs> All right, Mr. Hamilton. To the question. That is a great question. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, we did our research on this before even uh, moving into this space. And at the time we did our research, we found that there were two, and they were primarily, well, really the answer to that is there were none. There are none that are actually manufacturing. Most of them were buying the components for China, even the ones that were, were supplying the complete charging station, they were white boxing it. We have not found any actual manufacturing. Uh, even in the entire U.S., certainly none here in Minnesota. Um, and so, but one of the things we were able to do through our partnership with our manufacturers is be able to provide the same components and be cost competitive with China. That's what's a differentiator for us. Sometimes it's hard to compete in the U.S. from a manufacturing standpoint, but because of our relationship and our history, when we did our mold design and when we look at how we lay out things, we're able to do something that's very, very uh, impactful. We're able to say, look, hey, you can buy this part right here in the U.S. You can buy this part right here in Minnesota. And guess what? We can meet your target costing. Thank you. Uh, Follow-up, Senator Housley? No, thank you. Any other questions to the testifier? Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you to the other testifiers. We sincerely appreciate your conversation today. We'll be in touch with um, uh, you when a bill comes up that we will have and just talk a little more detail and flesh out some of the other details that Senator Nelson is interested in as well. All right? Thank you, Thank you so very much. Uh, members, we are now go to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, if Dr. Ferguson would come forward uh, to the testifiers table and once you're ready, Dr. Ferguson, state your name for the record, please, uh, and then you can begin with your presentation. Dr. Ferguson. Ferguson. Mr. Chair, members, good afternoon. My name is Tim Bussey, and I am the Government Relations Manager at Skywater Technology in Bloomington. While Dr. Ferguson is getting set up here and ready to go, I just wanted to uh, First of all, thank you all so very much for the time and the interest that you're putting into this very important topic of, of the microchips industry in, in Minnesota. Uh, Chair Champion, I, you're, I was struck by your opening remarks and it's tempting to say, to simply sit here and say, yes, that's exactly it. And, and all of the, the points that you made in terms of the possibilities of job development, economic development across the state of Minnesota and the important national security issues that are associated with this, with the CHIPS Act and with microchip production, uh, returning that domestically to the United States and to Minnesota. So I appreciate that, and as I said, appreciate the interest of the entire uh, committee on this important topic. Also want to uh, give a tip of the cap to Dr. Iyer for his outstanding presentation, his overview, which kind of laid a lot of uh, issues on the table. The students at the University of St. Thomas are, are fortunate to have him. Uh, I will say that Polar and Skywater are our neighbors. If we each stood on our respective roofs in Bloomington and waved, we could probably see each other. We're that close together. And uh, that's an important point because uh, both uh, the, the points that uh, Dr. Iyer made, Skywater and Polar are part of a consortium of, uh, of organizations and uh, businesses in Minnesota working together to advance this possibility in, in the state of Minnesota. So uh, a consortium of, of businesses, uh, businesses up and down the supply chain, the University of Minnesota, the Minskew system, our friends at Greater MSP with the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. It's a, it's a good sized group, a good sized consortium working toward the common goal of trying to advance this, uh, advance this industry in the state of Minnesota. Also want to echo Dr. Iyer's 
thanks to Governor Walls and the, uh, the money that was allocated in his budget proposal to, uh, to forward this, but also to echo Dr. Iyer saying that that, that that is a good start. The money that uh, was brought forward, that no total was a good start. But to really accomplish and to really take full advantage of the CHIPS Act at the, fe at the federal level, we really need to make a commitment by the state of Minnesota to step forward in terms of matching dollars. And we have basically one shot at this. And if we don't do this, Texas, uh, Florida, Indiana, California will. And so we have one shot at this, and it's, an, it's a wonderful opportunity. And so I hope we can continue that conversation. And I think I've uh, tap danced long enough now, Mr. Chair, and um, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Ferguson is ready to go. So uh, thank you for your time, and once again, thank you for your interest in this important So thank topic. you for those comments. Thank you for taking the time to sort of set the stage and also echo some of the things that Dr. Iyer has said. And with that being said, so we give you more than enough time to make a robust presentation. We'll now turn to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. And, and I do uh, would... Uh, you apologize, it, it appears I'm not able to share my screen from my laptop, and so it may be that we have to follow on, along page by page. Maybe one of the folks of, uh, around the other uh, table can help us help you. And just for the record, while they're helping you, and we're going through it, uh, please state your name for the record. Even though I said it, we'd like to make sure that you say it and where you're from. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Dr. Brad Ferguson. I'm with Skywater Technology. I'm the uh, Chief Government Affairs Officer at Skywater. I'm also the uh, Senior Vice President and General Manager. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, General Manager of the Aerospace and Defense Business Unit at Skywater. Um, I'm a Minnesota native. Uh, lived here all my life except for five years when I pursued my graduate degree at the University of Texas and have invested my career in, in semiconductors. <clears throat> Uh, I'm here to talk to you about federal incentives for semiconductor infrastructure, which requires significant state and local incentives, as described, um, that are incorporated into the final mix of funding in order to be a successful award under this program. And it's an opportunity to shore up our national and economic security with domestic manufacturing in this important industry. And not just for semiconductors, but for all industries which rely on semiconductors, which I'll talk about briefly. So, in, uh, uh, as Dr. Iyer described, what is a semiconductor? It's uh, basically elements that have switches. Uh, think of them as integrated circuits. They're also called chips. Um, they're an important part of uh, all of our modern lives and, and nearly all industries. A, a point of historical interest and, and to expand on Dr. Iyer's comments about control data, and I promise I'll be brief, Minnesota used to be the epicenter for computing innovation. During the 60s, 70s, and 80s, control data was a dominant player in mainframe computing. But the fast pace of innovation caught up with control data, leading to disruption of their business model. Many former business segments of control data, data became highly successful industry leaders. Uh, control data's magnetic peripherals division, for example, for which my father worked as an employee, an engineer for many years, spun out to become Seagate, a world leader in data storage. Uh, General Dynamics in Bloomington came from control data's uh, government business systems. Uh, Ceridian came from control data's information services uh, division. And uh, Polar and S Skywater were once control data's bipolar and CMOS fabs. And so we have a long history of innovation and technology leadership in the state. And from our perspective, the CHIPS bill, the CHIPS law, is a unique opportunity to reclaim our heritage as the Silicon Heartland. As mentioned, uh, the semiconductor industry enables many other industries. One thing that COVID underscored for all of us is that the semiconductor industry underpins nearly all, every industry with technology involved. As demand for home office equipment soared, uh, automotive production lines were idled uh, for lack of chips, costing billions of dollars in lost productivity and many, many jobs and the fragility of the semiconductor supply chain 
was laid bare, leading many to call for reshoring to protect our national and economic security. Uh, we, we do live in a dynam dynamic world, and certainly the semiconductor industry is no uh, exception to that rule. Uh, IP and information security concerns are, are growing. Uh, supply chain risks uh, motivate reshoring, as described, and, and improve transparency. But the cost of being at the leading edge uh, is rising exponentially. And so while most semiconductor innovation and equipment is manufactured here in the U.S., only 12% of microelectronics manufacturing actually happens in the U.S. And that's uh, highlighted here in, in perhaps a similar fashion to uh, Dr. Iyer, uh, who, who similarly highlighted uh, the, the uh, dominance of, of pure play foundry, um, the pure play foundry segment of the value chain in semiconductors by uh, Asian and, and overseas players. In particular, Taiwan controls 76% of the pure play foundry market. That's wafer uh, manufacturing, uh, a key element and the most expensive element in that supply chain. Literally a silicon shield, sorry, figuratively a silicon shield protects tai Taiwan from China. And China is investing $150 billion uh, to capture chip technology. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, if China were to take over the island or attempt reunification, the resulting disruptions might make COVID's supply chain disruptions look like a minor bump in the road, unfortunately. While Skywater is doing its part to reshore jobs and semiconductor manufacturing, our mission, our business, is to revolutionize technology realization. Uh, Skywater's unique business model is an open access foundry model which means that we don't make our own products, uh, but we develop technology and manufacture products solely for our customers. We combine, in a unique way, technology development and production inside of the same facility to enable prototyping and manufacturing in order to maximize efficiency. A security overlay uh, enables my business unit, the Aerospace and Defense Business Unit, to support DOD programs alongside our commercial line, again creating synergies. And we are the only U.S.-owned Pure Play Trusted Foundry in the U.S. operating with this model. And so we do answer a unique call. Our technology pipeline enables universities, startups, and Fortune 10 companies alike to innovate with us and create differentiated technologies to serve valued markets. Uh, Skywater has two operating sites and is planning uh, to open a third site, um, but I'll focus on our site in Minnesota, which is our headquarters and our first site. Uh, we have over 600 employees and we have uh, over 75 job openings today. These are well-paying permanent jobs with full benefits, spanning a variety of experience and education levels. With uh, investments described later, we are charting a course to increasing our output two to three times, along with similar increases in employment. <clears throat> and so now I'll, I'll transition to talking about how the Chips and Science Act of 2022 uh, will um, affect our industry and how Skywater plans to uh, take advantage of that bill. Uh, I'll first start by highlighting that uh, President Biden called attention to this issue. Uh, and, <clears throat> and actually, this wafer that he's holding up is actually a Skywater wafer uh, stemming from our uh, uh, microelectronics rad hard uh, program. And uh, I would invite each and every one of you to uh, visit Skywater. You can see the, the wafer that the president held up, but more importantly, see all of our great employees in action uh, making technology happen today. <clears throat> so uh, the chips and science law is, is broken up in, in segments as described by Dr. Iyer uh, quite well. The first and largest program is manufacturing incentives, $39 billion allocated to increase scale in the U.S. and uh, help reshore uh, this industry. Uh, we have in Minnesota uh, a two-phased plan. Uh, the first phase would be a fab upgrade inside of our existing uh, four walls with additional tooling to, uh, with, a, with a target of increasing our fab up to output up to uh, 2x our current levels. 
it would require up to uh, $500 million in investment and would create 200 uh, direct jobs. We use a five to one multiplier when talking about indirect to direct jobs, so we would estimate about 1,000 indirect jobs. A second phase is, uh, is being uh, contemplated and designed, and that would increase further uh, beyond our four walls and add scale and uh, technology. There's an R&D program, second, uh, $11 billion allocated, and this R&D program speaks to our business model of technology development. And we would plan to uh, engage uh, in, in the various threads in that program, including the, uh, the um, NSTC, National Semiconductor Technology Center. Third, as described by Dr. Iyer, uh, DOD Commons is an R&D network of labs, fabs, and startups for prototyping and bringing technologies that are uh, currently concepts and traversing the valley of death into productization. And, and, and this, this speaks very much to our business model, and, uh, and we plan to serve as what's called a core facility within the framework of this program. And last, uh, but certainly not least, is the investment tax credit. 25% in, in the form of a refundable tax credit uh, for equipment and upgrades placed into service between now and 2026. And we plan to use that to uh, increase the leverage on any investments. I'll just add as commentary that, that this uh, is a, uh, a really good start at leveling the playing field for incentives that are currently offered in uh, Asian markets and other areas where manufacturing is subsidized. Uh, it, by some estimates, uh, as much as 40% is subsidized by uh, local governments overseas. And so uh, further, uh, we, we plan to continue our engagements with community partners, University of Minnesota as uh, as uh, a research partner, uh, we have uh, several engagements with Normandale Community College and Hennepin Tech, including a innovative apprenticeship program where uh, students can work at Skywater while gaining credit towards their degree. And this is a very important element of our efforts to train maintenance technicians to, uh, to maintain the very expensive fab equipment that is required in this industry. And public-private private partnerships do work. We need more of them. Uh, there's, there's several that we're engaged with currently. Uh, a couple of them are highlighted here, and, and this is a great way to cultivate a healthy, uh, domestic, and globally competitive ecosystem. So I'll, I'll just highlight that in 21, we had the pleasure of hosting Governor Walls and Deed Commissioner Grove at Skywater to talk about the semiconductor shortage and Minnesota's participation in the federal bill that would eventually become and pass and become the Chips and Science Law. At the time, Governor Walls assured us that Minnesota would support participation at the state level, and we would like to thank the governor for putting forward funding in his budget this year. As described, this is a very capital-intensive industry, and while this is an excellent start, we would draw attention to the need for additional support to be competitive with other states that are putting forward much larger efforts. Skywater is also thankful uh, for the support from Greater MSP and the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. And we look forward to continue partnering with our local ecosystem partners and leading and helping with messaging to stakeholders in our community. We recently hosted uh, U.S. Representative Betty McCollum uh, to our site, along with Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Ms. Heidi Hsu and Principal De Director for Microelectronics, Dr. Dave Shinoy. Uh, in particular, Dr. Shinoy is, is um, chartered with the uh, Commons program, and so we were happy to receive him and describe how our facility would be complementary to those efforts. Uh, we've also hosted Senator Klobuchar to our site uh, a couple of times, as well as uh, U.S. Representative Dean Phillips, who visited our site, and so we, we uh, um, have uh, been very engaged in, in our local community and, and will continue that engagement. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, and it also looks like you, you also hosted Minnesota Representative P. Stauber as well, it looks like. Yes, we did, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, any questions for the testifier? Uh, Senator Draham. 
Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, very impressive, uh, along with the other two companies. Uh, I'm very excited to support some type of program to help in these efforts. I think it's uh, uh, imperative to the country and, and the state to do a better job than what we've done in the business climate. Uh, one concern I've always had with helping out companies is the retention of the company in Minnesota. So as we move forward with trying to find a solution that matches what the feds say we have to do and actually helps you guys <laughs> and the other two companies that came forward today, what, what should we put in or embed in our bill to help you to ensure uh, the entities that receive the funds stay in Minnesota, especially a company like yours that has multiple locations? Good question. Uh, which one of the testifier wants to? Uh, Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Senator, for the question. Uh, that, that's a good question, and I think it warrants further discussion. Uh, certainly, um, uh, I would suggest that uh, a, a jobs creation number is a, a relevant factor that should be considered in any incentives. Um, it, if I could, uh, yes. Mr. Chair, uh, members, Senator, uh, I think another practical matter is FABs are um, heavily capital, hev capital heavy. And so to make investment an investment in the size that Skywater would need to expand and then to relocate somewhere would honestly make no practical sense, give, just given the size of the investment that is going to be necessary to really take the step that we're hoping to take. And so uh, I agree there could be specific language in there, uh, but I think there's also the practical matter of, of the, the large capital investment would be just uh, foolish to walk away from. Any other testifies? Uh, Senator Gustafson. Hello, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I actually had the same question as Senator Draham. I just wanted to make sure that the money that you know, would come from Minnesota would stay at the Bloomington Fab and that it wouldn't be used in Indiana or Florida. Is, is that what you were assuring him in your answer? Uh, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, to testify. Senator Gustafson, uh, uh, I, I believe that the way that the, the CHIPS Act is written and the way, the way it's all pulled together, the, the proposal that we would make for the Bloomington Fab, the funding that we would receive as a matching grant, uh, you know, uh, put together through the state of Minnesota, through other local entities, through our investors, matching the federal grants, I think would be very specific to the state of Minnesota and to the Bloomington facility. Follow up, Senator Gustafson. So you can assure us that it would stay in Bloomington is what you're saying? To the testifier. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. And thank you for the question. Yes, absolutely. This would, as, as, uh, as, as um, Mr. Bussey described, this would be unique to Minnesota and the, the monies would be expended in Minnesota. Any follow-up? Uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm not sure who wants to answer this, but Mr. Bussey at the beginning of his presentation said, you know, referenced the governor's proposal of $150 million, um, but then made the comment that, you know, we really need to have full matching funds. My understanding is we don't have all the, the guidance from the feds yet, but I'm wondering, I mean, as we look at this in its entirety, <coughs> What do you see as as being, um, you know, true matching, true matching funds uh, for the Chips Act, uh, Mr. Bussey or Dr. Ferguson? Who wants to answer? Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, so that's a very good question, and and as described uh, previously, uh, uh, Department of Commerce has not released yet any formulas, and uh, the notice of funding opportunity has not been released yet either. And so we do look to that for guidance with respect to what their expectations are. I, I will add, however, that uh, you know it, it is a competition, and so um, the, the the successful awards will be the ones that that put forward the strongest combination of uh, funding sources and and certainly state and local. Uh, funding match uh, will make for a, a stronger um, proposal. What, um, you know, if I were to speculate, you know, I, I would expect that something in, in the 10% range is, is what would make a successful uh, bid. 
for uh, for funding. But I'll add that again. We're we're looking for guidance from the department. Uh, we're we're looking. Yeah. My apologies, uh, Mr. Chair and. Senator Pratt, uh, we'll certainly be looking for guidance from uh, Department of Commerce when they when they release their guidance. So, Senator Pratt, it sounds like to me that they don't have all that information, and even though a comment was made that we need to have a robust, you know, match, we don't know what that looks like yet, right? And so, I naturally assume that as that information becomes clear, that information will be shared with this this committee as well, because that would be a part of our decision making as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and I agree. If I if I may, I, I agree. I was just I was just wondering because it sounded like there was an expectation the 150 was going to be too little, and wondering if they had, you know, any thoughts around what a better estimate might be, uh, at least for planning purposes. But it sounds like we don't we don't have that yet. We 150 might be fully appropriate. We don't know. It sounds like that's the answer. Thank you, Senator Pratt, for your question. Uh, but I will, will assure the committee that once we get more information and more guidance is provided, that will be shared with you as well. Any additional questions for Dr. Ferguson or Dr. Bussey before we go to our last testifier, who's been quite patient today, I will say. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, thank you to the testifiers. Thank you to Skywater for all your work. Thank you for being with us today. We look forward to having additional discussions with you in the near future. So uh, last but certainly not least, Mr. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correctly, Frosch? Oh, good. See, pat myself on the back for that. Please approach the testifier's table and state your name for the record and who you're with uh, and, and provide for the members any uh, information that you deem worthy. Mr. Frosch. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I have young children, so I'm very patient. I've, I've learned that. <laughs> so my pleasure. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be with you today and speak about the economic opportunity that Minnesota has this year to expand our semiconductor industry and maybe provide some additional economic context. For and Mr. Frost, will you do me one quick favor? I've been saying this to each person, but once they get to the mic, they seem to forget it. Could you speak directly into okay. the mic? And, and sometimes your voices drop off, and, that, and if you could just help us out by trying to keep that voice elevated, because we really want to hear all the wonderful things that you're going to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of Greater MSP. Greater MSP is the nonpartisan 501c3 Regional Economic Development Partnership for the 15-county Minneapolis-St. Paul region. Established in 2011 to grow the region's economy, we are a partnership of hundreds of companies, cities, counties, foundations, and universities. Uh, last year, over 350 different organizations and more than 550 individuals actively participated in 50 different projects that we are leading across the economy. All of this work is part of one regional economic strategy, and that strategy is focused on deepening Minnesota's leadership in economic sectors where we are already strong. So food and agriculture, healthcare and health tech, finance and insurance, and advanced manufacturing sectors such as semiconductors. You might be familiar with economic development partnerships in other parts of the state, such as Greater Mankato Growth, Greater St. Cloud Growth, Apex and Duluth, the Rochester Economic Development Initiative. These are all groups that Greater MSP works with. Uh, the work of Greater MSP is comprehensive and growing. Together, we help employers expand and hire in Minnesota and we bring new companies into Minnesota from around the US and world. We help grow the startup ecosystem uh, with fast growth companies. We grow small and medium sized businesses by connecting them to procurement from large Minnesota based corporations. We work to retain professionals, or professional talent in Minnesota and attract more talent to Minnesota. We connect young adults of color to great careers. We help add domestic and international flights to the MSP airport, and more. All of Greater MSP's work is guided by data. We track and analyze the vitality and competitiveness of the metro and state economy. And we have been increasingly focused on our state economy's growth rate, which is low and slowing relative to our peers. Minnesota's GDP growth now trails the U.S. average. 
Between 2014 and 2021, Minnesota's economy grew 9.9%. The U.S. average for states in that period was 14.7%. As recently as 2014, Minnesota's GDP growth ranked 10th in the U.S. By 2021, we had fallen to 35th. So that's why the conversation about the chip sector is so important right now. Low and slow economic growth means the best jobs are going elsewhere in the country. Slow growth will shrink economic opportunities for all Minnesotans and suppress household income. And it will make every other problem we're trying to solve harder to solve. So what can we do this year to increase economic growth, create more great jobs for Minnesotans, and safeguard our quality of life? One thing we can do is we can support fast growth industries that will create the most jobs and the highest paying jobs in the decade ahead. Now, Minnesota is not competitive in every fast growth industry. So where we are competitive, we need to win. For example, Minnesota is not competitive in the offshore wind equipment sector. Uh, that sector is growing fast but we don't have the infrastructure and supply chain in our state to, to build that spe specified equipment. We are one of the most competitive locations in the US and world for medical device manufacturing, and that's probably not surprising. But you might be surprised to learn, maybe a little less surprised at this stage of the hearing, that Minnesota is also highly competitive in semiconductor manufacturing. The semiconductor industry is an important part of what makes Minnesota's economy productive and competitive today. Minnesota is one of 18 states in the U.S. that's home to major semiconductor manufacturing facilities. Our history of supercomputing and semiconductors, as has been mentioned, goes back to the 1960s. Today, according to statistics from Deed, Minnesota's semiconductor and electronics industry includes 143 establishments across the state, employing 9,300 Minnesotans, and creating 1.57 billion in gross regional product. 30% of these jobs are outside the metro region, so about 3,000 jobs. Now, there's been a lot of talk about semiconductors nationally due to the centrality of uh, Amer or due to their centrality to American national security and our economic leadership in the world. Uh, there are several reasons why the semiconductor industry is a super sector when it comes to economic growth. First, jobs in the semiconductor industry create many more good jobs. For every one U.S. worker directly employed in the semiconductor industry, an additional 5.7 jobs are supported in the wider economy, which is one of the highest job multipliers of any sector. Second, these are very good jobs. Average earnings per job in the semiconductor and related manufacturing sector are 90% higher than average earnings for all jobs in Minnesota. And third, the semiconductor industry creates jobs in many different occupations at multiple skill levels. For example, with an associate degree, you can earn $29 or more as an industrial engineering technician or electrical engineering technician. With a bachelor's degree, you can earn over $45 an hour as an industrial engineer or software developer or electrical engineer. And these are really conservative estimates. We should also consider the hundreds, if not thousands, of construction-related jobs that would be supported by expanding these high-tech facilities in Minnesota. Well, if this isn't a new industry, why are we talking about this now? Minnesota's semiconductor industry is in the spotlight because of the U.S. government's investment of billions of dollars in the industry. The Chips and Science Act passed with bipartisan support and was signed on August 9, 2022. The law aims to catalyze investments in domestic semiconductor manufacturing capacity and jumpstart R&D. $280 billion will be spent through this law over the next 10 years, 52 billion of it for semiconductor manufacturing and R&D. There's urgency to act now because much of this funding will be approved by the U.S. Department of Commerce this year. 
So as a result, Minnesota has an opportunity to expand employment in the sector that we could not have imagined just a couple of years ago. But the 17 other states that have chip industries have the same idea. And the competition for these federal dollars from other states is going to be fierce. So we talk about a, co a coalition and we talk about applications. This will be a, a fight for these federal dollars. The states that are successful in securing federal funds will see billions in new, pr new private investment, thousands of new good jobs, and will position themselves as national leaders for many years to come. Those that don't secure federal funds will struggle to compete. And to secure the CHIPS Act funding, you have to apply, and to apply, you must have state matching funds. We're watching what Ohio's doing. Ohio's dedicated $2 billion to the one uh, Intel facility. New York has committed up to $10 billion in state support for over 20 years for future projects. Idaho, Illinois, and Nebraska are all moving um, major pieces of legislation. This is a moment where we lead or we lose. Expanding microchip manufacturing in Minnesota is a high confidence, high priority action step to jumpstart economic growth, create great jobs at multiple skill levels, and create sustained opportunity for Minnesota communities and families. As you've heard, we have a right to win this. We have embedded competitive advantages, we have the workforce, we have a robust existing ecosystem, and we have a geographic advantage with reduced exposure to some weather events. And that's why Grid MSP is leading a public-private coalition of semiconductor manufacturers, higher education institutions, and others to compete and win these federal dollars. The opportunity is historic, the window is open, and we very much appreciate your attention uh, to this immediate and exciting opportunity for the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Forsh. Any questions? Uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Foss. Just a, a quick question. I'm not sure if this is in your real house or not, but could you expound a little bit on the nature of automation in the semiconductor industry as, as it is right now? Uh, and are the jobs that we were talking about, the diverse tiers that you were mentioning, are these jobs that we can have confidence are immune to redundancy due to automation in the next mm. five to 10 years? Mm. Mr. Frosch. Mr. Chair, um, Senator, with respect, I, I would defer that question to the semiconductor manufacturers who are with us who will have better answers to that very good question. Would you like for one of them to come up, or you want to? Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if they've got something to add, that'd be great. Uh, if not, that's OK, too. Anyone want to add anything? If not, you could also talk to uh, Senator Putnam offline as well. But I see Dr. Uh, Iyer and Dr. Ferguson. Please remember to uh, identify yourself for the record, and you can answer the question. Thank you, Chair. Again, my name is Surya Iyer. I'm the president of Polar Semiconductor in Bloomington, Minnesota. And uh, Chair, um, thank you again. Senator, the um, level of automation in semiconductor is variable depending on what node of technology we're talking about. Some of the very advanced technology fabs, for example, in Taiwan or Intel fab, highly, highly um, automated. What that means is, does not mean that does not need human beings uh, to work there. It just means that the people who work there have to have more skills, and usually the starting um, uh, degree requirements would be a two-year uh, technical degree, because the machines become more complicated, more sophisticated, and you need a lot more of the uh, maintenance and uh, uh, engineering technicians to fix those machines and engineers to develop the new technologies to go forward. So that's uh, just a, uh, kind of a picture of the very cutting edge type of factories. Um, coming to uh, back to closer to home, uh, companies like Polar, we are way less automated. We do have a lot of automation, but we are relatively less automated. Uh, for example, in the 550 employees that uh, we have at Polar, 300 of those employees are uh, operators. So these are people who are um, high school or less, um, generally speaking. 
And then we have about 100 maintenance technicians, and the rest are engineers and other support staff. So that's kind of the breakdown of the uh, headcount at Polar. Uh, so it, with, with CHIPS Act, um, there will be an effort to make these factories more automated because that does improve the efficiency of the factory. It makes us more cost competitive. But we will be hiring a lot of skilled employees. We'll continue to hire a lot of operators as we expand. Um, but I suspect, and I'm not 100% sure at this point, but I think we, I suspect more of the hiring will happen in the maintenance technician. The two-year uh, graduate, uh, technical graduates would be the majority of the hires that we'll make. But we'll also be hiring engineers and operators at the same time. So Dr. I hope that answers your question. Dr. Ferguson, do you want to add anything, or you're okay with the answer that's been given? Dr. Ferguson? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief because I agree 100% with what Dr. Iyer uh, described. I'll just simply add that uh, our focus at Skywater is on value creation, right? So we, we uh, uh, deliver on our business value by adding value to our customers, and, and so uh, bringing in more and higher skilled individuals and and leveling up the skill level of our workforce is, is a key focus for us um, and and that's how we are competitive globally in in this industry uh, certainly I share the view that automation is important to remain competitive and and uh, we are uh, semi automated similar to the the facility uh, that dr. Iyer runs and we will continue to invest incrementally in automation as well. And so uh, we, we, will, uh, we anticipate that we would be adding, uh, uh, adding a, a large number of jobs with this uh, CHIPS bill investment. Thank you, Mr. Uh, any follow-up, uh, Senator Putnam, or are you okay? No, thank you, Dr. Ferguson, Dr. Iyer, and Mr. Chair. All right, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Oh, uh, Senator Pratt. Well, it's not really a question, Mr. Chair. It's, I think it's more of a comment. So I, before you adjourn, I'd just like a couple of seconds. That's fine. Senator Hurd, you, you had your hand up. Yes, I do. Um, I just want to make a remark as well um, before you adjourn. I'd like to make a big remark as well. All right. So uh, I'm going to ask everyone to remember to speak up and use your best outside voice because I'm having a hard time hearing even <coughs> this wonderful committee. So, okay, I know that you have that very white voice and you don't want to talk very loud. But it'd be helpful. Uh, did you have something, Senator Nelson? No. Okay, thank you so much. Anything else? All right, thank you to the testifiers. And before I leave this notion, I want to make sure, thank you to the testifiers, you're okay, that I thank them before we get our last comments. I want to thank um, FlexForge, so Mr. Hamilton, uh, Dr. Cunningham, uh, Mr. Du, uh, Dukanik, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. All right, thank you so much. Dr. Iyer, thank you so much for being here from Polar. Just a side note, Polar used to be or is, is a byproduct of control data, data, and my mother worked for control data uh, when we think in terms of the manufacturing plant. She wasn't an engineer, but I'm sure that she thinks that she knew everything she needed to know about the company. Uh, Mr. Bussey, thank you for being here, as well as Dr. Uh, Ferguson from Skywater. And... Um, and, 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 of course, Mr. Frosch from, did I pronounce it right? Yep, okay, it. all right, from uh, Greater MSP. I sincerely appreciate it. One thing for everyone to know that we do not have a bill, but once we have a bill, we will try to bring it before this committee expeditiously because we believe that this is an important issue. So once, it, once we receive it, we will uh, go for it. So now, with that being said, before we move to adjourn. Uh, I believe that uh, Senator Pratt wanted to have some comments, and then we'll go to Senator Hurt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to all of our testifiers today. Uh, and I want to thank you for bringing this conversation, you know, to the forefront. I think it's, it's timely and it's, it's extremely relevant. Uh, you know, I think it was Dr. Iyer mentioned that decades ago we were viewed as a technology hub, and we were viewed as a financial hub. And over time, we've lost, while we've been able to keep some of those, you know, some of those uh, uh, companies here, many have, many have left. Uh, uh, Pentair moved to London, Honeywell uh, to New Jersey, Alliant Tech to Virginia, uh, and Cray Research 
uh, I had out in Seattle. Uh, you know, some of our you know large financial institutions, Norwest merged with uh, or w with Wells Fargo and moved their their headquarters out. I've talked to you know I've talked to CEOs and and uh, board members about investing in Minnesota, and they they've talked you know about why they made investments in other areas. Um, whether it's pharmaceuticals, agribusiness, um, uh, you know, technology like this. And I think as we have this conversation and, and matching funds for um, uh, the, the CHIPS Act, I think is important. I think we also have to look at the entire system on what makes Minnesota a great place to invest. Um, Governor Walls at the chamber dinner talked about the permitting process and how that's been a hindrance to uh, uh, moving forward. Um, we, you and I worked together on Launch Minnesota uh, as a way to bring innovative businesses. And, and while these technology companies left, we you know, have been able to try to spur innovation and, and continue to try to spur innovation, maybe not as quickly as we'd like, but uh, along the way. Um, I think we have to look at key industries like technology, like pharmaceuticals, like agribusiness, um, and like mining, quite honestly. I mean, we have some of the, some of the natural resources that will be fueling the, the economy of the future. And, and just, I wanted to touch on, on one, one comment that, that Dr. Iyer made to me yesterday when we were talking about workforce development and the fact that many of these companies the skill sets don't exist today. They're having to create them. They're having to train them themselves. And I think we need to recognize that as part of our workforce development uh, initiatives as well. Not only to uh, do what Senator Herr said, make sure that we've got uh, our own residents that are able to take these jobs, but also to attract people to our wonderful state. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, thank you for this conversation. It was an exciting conversation, and I appreciate everybody coming and and sharing their perspective and, um, you know, and, and talking about making things in Minnesota again. Um, for decades, we've become a service economy. And I don't know that we can survive as a service economy. We have to make things. We have to export things. And, and that's why I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for hosting it today. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Senator Pratt. All right, Senator Hurt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the uh, presenters that are here today. Also, appreciate um, minority, um, ranking minority leader Pratt you know, for mentioning my remark earlier. And I'm just going to reiterate the, very much the same thing. Um, you know, um, your CA, uh, Mr. Milton, had called me and said, Senator, you got to hurry up and see if you can get to hear this this presentation today. You know, I was on my way to uh, meet our Olympic champion, but I miss her. Uh, Senator Housley, we were able to get there before, and I, I miss her, you know, and then I ran back here and able to hear uh, the presentation. Uh, sound like a very exciting time here in Minnesota, and I didn't realize that Minnesota will be intertwined with the uh, international platform. And the opportunity is here, as one of the presenters said, either we lead it or we, we lose it. Uh, but when the opportunity here, we also have, we, the, the, the window opportunity is very narrow for us as people of color, minority, and disadvantaged community to insert or crap into legislation to insert uh, for the future generation to have a chance in this opportunity. So at some point, if legislation come, come forward, um, perhaps our community here, or you and I, we need to look at carefully. So our ingrown youth of colors, um, South Asian in particular, Somali in particular, African American in particular, would have a, and also youth of rural area, would have the opportunity for this uh, wave, like all Thai ra ra race all ship, as one always say here in this country. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. Any other, anything else? See nothing else. Um, uh, you know that we will have some bills up next week. 
And so we'll make sure that information gets to you expeditiously. And thank you so very much for being here. The committee is now adjourned.